Hello everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. I hope y'all are doing great today. Things are pretty good over here in Sofa Land. I can't really complain. We are going to start looking at a new trial. Another one that I took one look at and was like, I have to watch this, this is horrendous. And so we're just gonna make some commentary on it. Uh, in this video, I'm gonna go do like a quick overview of the case, and then we're gonna talk about day one and the testimony. So, as we like to say now, without further ado, let's review. Okay, so the name of this trial, we're gonna call it just the Rosenbaum trial. That's the name of the defendants in this. Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum are accused in the 2015 killing of Layla Marie Daniel. Jennifer Rosenbaum is facing multiple charges in this, uh, ranging from murder, aggravated assault, cruelty to children. Joseph is also facing charges, including cruelty to children in the first degree. Now, Layla and her sister live with the Rosenbaums for about five months before Layla's death. Now, the Rosenbaums were Layla, Daniel's foster parents, when they say that she choked to death on a chicken bone on November 17th, 2015. But the autopsy told a completely different story. The medical and examiner ruled that she died from abuse and sustained a number of serious injuries during her time with the Rosenbaums, including but not limited to transected pan pancreas, severe blood loss, broken bones in both arms and legs, bruising on the neck, face, abdomen, legs, and inadequate nutrition. Now, in the arrest warrants, they say that Jennifer struck Layla so hard shortly before her death that resulted in a transected pancreas, which is essentially it split in two. The warrant says that the injury was stated by GBI personnel as being a major contributing factor to her death. Now, on the surface level, the Rosenbaums seemed like really ideal foster parents for these girls. Jennifer worked for the Henry County District Attorney's Office. She was actually running for a seat on the Henry County Commission. Now, Layla's mother, Tessa Daniel, that is who the biological mother is to the children. The reason that Tessa chose Jennifer and her husband to be the foster parents that for temporary custody is because she had actually spent time in foster care herself with Jennifer when they were younger. So let's go, now that we have a little bit of an overview and more of this will come out in the testimony that we hear throughout the trial, let's talk about some of the stuff that took place on day one of testimony. Now, the prosecution's theme, the prosecution's opening statements, basically the theme of what she was saying is that the Rosenbaums were liars, abusers, murderers, and that everything was a facade. Everything was an image, and that behind closed doors, it was a house of horrors. Now, at one point, the prosecutor went over and picked up a poster board that had family pictures all on it, and apparently she picked it up from the defense table, and she held it up and yelled at the jury, this is a facade this is a facade and went on but I forget what else she said and she took it back and kind of threw it down on the ground now I at first thought that it was her evidence and when she threw it on the ground someone from over at the table said hey that's mine and she kind of looked at the table almost like come again you know what did you say and then the judge told her to pick it up and she was like oh you know oh, okay she was like the judge is gonna have to tell me to pick that up and so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit because i've got a lot to say about that and i actually have some questions to see what y'all think about it too uh but that's kind of set the tone for going forward now the rosenbaum's defense attorney uh her name's corny mole she got up there and it was a completely different story she said the pancreas could have been injured during attempts by jennifer to and the paramedics to revive her and the other injuries could have occurred in previous foster homes now on the day of the toddler's death jennifer rosenbaum had actually contacted the case manager with the department of family and child services and she told the case manager that she tried to dislodge food uh, when layla began choking on it and according to a report from dfcs uh, jennifer told the case manager that she then used a butter knife to try to push the chicken down but was unsuccessful as layla continued to choke uh, now, again, y'all, this is another case that is glowing failures from DCF at D DFCF that they, they were overseeing this case. Uh, a report found that they did not intervene during questionable circumstances before she, several months before the child died, and they were eventually fired. Now, if y'all know the case that we just followed, uh, Tim Jones Jr., this was another major, you know, dropping the ball 
on these the DSS over there where they were at in South Carolina. Uh, you know, we just did a podcast. Owen and I did a podcast on this where we talked about DSS. You know, this is a major thing that needs to take place because these cases just keep coming up over and over and over again where there is a chance to save these children and it's just not happening for some reason. Now, during opening statements, the prosecutor asked the jury to keep good notes of the trial, you know, dates and times and stuff like that. And then she starts piecing together an overview of, like, where the girls were in this time and who they were staying with and who had custody and who had temporary custody and the back and forth. And literally, I was like, oh, this is why she told them to take good notes because it's it's all over the place. And I'm sitting here trying to think to myself, and I'm like, this is so sad to see how these girls you know, didn't really stand a chance. You know what I'm saying? Like... I mean, it was just so unfortunate because I'm like, they're getting shuffled around here, there, dead to no consistency, no nothing. And, you know, that's why I think at a certain point when these foster parents, you know, temporary foster parents came along and they had all these kind of credentials going for them, it was like, oh, you know, this is wonderful. You know, here we go, some stability. And so everybody kind of ran after it. Now, also during the opening statement, uh, the prosecutor states that on the first day they had visitation with the baby, that she ended up in the hospital. So, you know, again, these details will come out further in evidence as it goes further. But, you know, it's not looking good so far. So again, when the defense gets up there, she has a whole different story and she starts right off and she's like, you know, she's like, see how they just stole the picture from us? Well, that's, you know, that's symbolic of this whole case. And there's something about her demeanor that I don't know. I'm trying to be, you know, not biased in this because she's representing people that I kind of am not liking already. Uh, but there's something about her that just rubbed me the wrong way. And, you know, she's saying that, and this is a huge part of it, too. You know, so she gets in there and starts with that, which I get. I mean, that was, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, because I have mixed feelings about that behavior from the prosecutor. Uh, but one of the things that she said that immediately I was like, you've lost me. I, I just, I, I'm done. Is she said that, you know, the kids clung to Jennifer and Joe and that people don't love their abusers like that. And she also said that, you know, they provided the kids with this, that, and the other, and da-da-da-da-da, and abusers don't treat the the abused that way, basically. And immediately I was like, what is she talking about? I mean, why would you even get up there and say that? I mean, that is a huge thing. You know, abusers don't buy, you know, treat their, of course they do. It doesn't mean they're abusing them constantly. It's part of the cycle, you know. I mean, it's part, I mean that's just part of that cycle. And to sit here and say, oh, that they clung to him. Well, these are small children. I mean, people, a lot of times, you know, especially young people, they, if they don't know any different, and it sounds like these kids were shuffled around, they were used to chaos. And whether they knew different or not, these were very young children. So, you know, these are going to be, oh, this is who's taking care of you. There's going to be a certain level of clinging to that. You know, they just don't really know any better at this age. I mean, they were they were just babies. So to sit here and get up there and try and dismiss that and with those two statements, I, I just felt like it was kind of like spitting on the grave of this little girl, to be honest. Uh, it just, I was insulted by it. And that just rubbed me the wrong way right then and there, on top of the way she kind of delivered stuff. So, I mean, honestly, I just didn't like the defense. I'm going to hopefully try and not be, you know, biased towards that going forward. But her opening statements, to me, I was just like, you know what, she didn't, this did not do this case any favors. Now, they bring up the first witness, which was one of the firefighters. And I'm going to have to say this. I was not really impressed with his testimony. I felt like he didn't really want to be there. And he could have been shy. I mean, he said that he was retired at this point. And who wants to be doing anything with something like this where you're testifying and having to deal with the loss of a young child like this? And he's basically describing when him and his partner showed up, what took place. The partner is basically the one that had the child. And kind of their reaction to seeing, you know, this this child with all these bruises and things like that on there. Um, and I, what the prosecution, I think, is trying to establish is, A, that shock, but B, you know, the child was dead when they showed up, essentially. And, you know, but they kept trying, they kept doing all this stuff. So these are some of the things that I was a little bit like, okay. Uh, you know, he says, uh-huh, a lot. Uh, he kind of mumbled through a lot of his stuff. He can't remember half the stuff. Now, mind you, y'all, this is four years ago. This is a long time ago. Uh, you know, he says the child was basically unresponsive when him and his partner got there. 
uh, you know, she, she was establishing that the child wasn't choking on food. That's a huge, I mean, that's what a big part of this case hangs on. Um, and then the defense gets up there and she asks if he checked the drains and he goes, no, I'm not a plumber. And you could tell he was a little bit like, what, what are you even asking me this for? People, I think, are a little put off, but the, there's something about the defense's demeanor that is very off-putting. It's not doing her 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 defendants uh, any favors at all. She asked him about, you know, the statement that he wrote down and the statement he does say that he saw the mother performing CPR, which, again, it... it whether she's completely lying or not, I mean, apparently there's no evidence of this child choking on anything, especially once they took it to the hospital, took her to the hospital, I'm sorry. Um, but I mean, if she knows that something went down, like if she gave this child a brutal beating, well, she's going to be pretending to give it CPR, give her CPR, I apologize, when she, when the paramedics show up. I mean, of course she would do that. That's just part of the facade. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of other things. Well, before we do that, let's talk about, so the coroner's got up there, and I'm not going to go into huge detail about, about that, because uh, to me, this is, that's just, you can see the pictures, the evidence of that, and whatnot. These children, or this child, Layla, she had a numerous wounds on her. Numerous wounds on her. So, you know, basically, the county coroner's reaction to seeing Layla's body was, wow. I mean, it literally quotes, wow. You know? And so, one of the things that they're trying to sit here and say is like, oh, well, these damages could have occurred during CPR. And it's like, the, what? What kind of CPR was this? This child is covered from head to toe and bruises, unhealed wounds, you know, broken arm that was never healed. Crazy stuff. So, you know, again, if you want to get deep into that testimony, it's a little jarring and it's just, you know, I want to leave that to your discretion. I don't want to put that on you. So go check out if you want to. It's on day one. The coroner testifies. So let's talk about a couple of things real quick. First of all, there was an issue with one of the jurors seemingly falling asleep during the opening statements, uh, which is an issue. And I think essentially what they came to is they were like, oh, well, he's concentrating or something like that. This is not a good sign on day one. I mean, if you're nodding off, which I I'm not trying to say anything I would have a hard... I mean, that was a dramatic opening. So I'm like, if you're going to fall asleep during that, when we get to the boring stuff of just, you know, going through the motions type thing, I mean, my gosh. So that was a little bit odd. Now, let's talk about the demeanor in the courtroom. And let's start right off with the prosecutor doing her thing. Now, the, the human, the person side of me, I was like, I love her outrage. I mean, because she, she got that across. She seemed genuinely, like, angry at these people and probably the defense. I get this vibe that her and the defense do not like each other outside of this. Like, there's just something there. I do not know if the prosecutor grabbed that thing and if it was the defendant, Jennifer, saying, hey, that's mine, or if it was the attorney saying that, because it kind of paints a picture two ways for me. If it was the attorney saying that, I mean, and I'm smiling here because it was just so, I was like, what? <laughs> these cases we've been looking at recently, y'all, all of them have this element of, what am, what am I watching? What am I watching? I have never, I mean, she took that from them. I thought it was her evidence and then tossed it back at their table like it was garbage. And I mean, it proved a point because I mean, she's sitting here like, really? And this is how I view it. You're going to come in here with a bunch of post pictures of a family together and then bring this tattered and torn bruised child, you know, into the hot, you know, as evidence this child's dead at your hands and you're going to try and show us this. Are you crazy? That type of I get the outrage. So I'm just curious and drop it in the comments like it's hot if you know. Was it Jennifer that said, hey, that's mine? Or was it the defense attorney? Because I also thought that the look she gave that table, I mean, she wasn't having it. I was like, they're going to scrap right here, y'all. And then the judge was like, pick that up. Pick that up. So let's move on to that. One thing that I am surprised to see in this courtroom, and let's use the firefighter guy as an example. Like, some of the stuff I was just like, why don't they say you need to either speak up or, you know, could you say yes or no, not uh-huh, uh-huh, no, uh, you know, these type of things and mumbling through. It was almost like, and not just him, but, you know, there's other other situations in the courtroom where I'm like, they're not real big on just general, like, maybe manners or whatever, or, you know, just going kind of by the book. Uh, so I found it a little bit odd, uh, you know, where I was just like, why don't they ask him to say yes or no and just be like, you know, yes, no. That's it. You know, we don't need much more than that, but just definitive answers and speak up a little bit, that type situation. 
Uh, you know, I'm curious just to see this energy between the defense and the prosecution is is interesting. I mean, I get a true sense of anger there. And, and so I just kind of feel like maybe this judge runs his courtroom like a little bit more relaxed or something. You know, I'll, I'm curious to see as it progresses how that goes. So I'm going to go ahead and start winding this out because it's looking like a 20-minute video here. And I don't want to bore you all to death. Uh, so again, my heart goes out to these children. I mean, this is just... This is awful. This is another one of those awful, depressing cases. And it will be interesting to see what plays out with it. Uh, I appreciate y'all choosing to spend time with me and watch this video. Uh, don't forget, if you want to know when my videos come up, to go ahead and click the bell. That's how you'll know when, when I'm here to hang out. And check that description out because we've got lots of links if you want to follow me on social media. Uh, started a new podcast where I discuss some of these cases with On from Toxic Bliss. And lots more. So that is it. I hope you all have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.